Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, important SABS uh, webinar. The um, title of the webinar is Security and Resilience, Business Continuity Management Systems. My name is Sadvir Basun, and uh, I am the executive for the Standards Division at the South African Bureau of Standards. This morning, we have um, a, uh, an elite panel of experts that are going to talk to us uh, and present various aspects of um, business continuity management systems. And um, these range from the various standards um, around business continuity management systems, including integrated approach of security and resilience, as well as a consumer perspective uh, of COVID-19 um, and the current pandemic that we're experiencing. So I'd like to officially um, welcome the, um, the panelists this morning. Our panelists are Mr. Robert Koch, Mr. Johan Oppermann and Dr. Netson Popiwa. I'd like to um, open up the, uh, the panelists to give a round of uh, welcome as well as an in introductory remark. So over to Robert Koch, followed by Johan Oppermann and Dr. Netson Popiwa. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I've a long history in working with standards, uh, uh, both um, locally in South Africa, the NRS standards, SABS standards, and the IEC standards. I currently head up um, Enterprise Resilience in ESCOM, and I have a very keen interest in uh, both resilience and complex adaptive systems. So I'll be talking a little bit to that today. So great to be on the panel. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, everyone. Johan Oppermann here. Uh, I am the CEO of uh, RISCO. It is a small consultancy, um, heavily involved in risk and governance, uh, all associated aspects with the strategy, and then very importantly, the integration of everything. Uh, nowadays, if we are going to operate in silos, then we will just not be competitive. So this is a bit of a passion to me, and I am glad to be able to share it with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ms. Kontikiwa, and I'm with the National Consumer Commission. I'm happy to be part of the panel today. My current research interests are in exploring particularly the effect of this pandemic on consumers when we look at price gouging and many other aspects that have really made consumers increase. I'm hoping to share some of those insights with you when I make my presentation. I look forward to engaging with some of you afterwards. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you to Robert, Johan, and, uh, and Netson. Um, just a few um, comments for information. Uh, this webinar has um, the functionality for question and answers, so you can uh, get into the icon for Q&A and uh, pose your questions, comments in there. Um, we have um, uh, an agenda, which I'll go through in a minute, um, where the speakers will be highlighting the various concepts of business continuity management system, and thereafter we'll have a panel discussion uh, and raise some questions uh, or answers to the questions that have been raised uh, by the participants. So um, without further ado, I would like to just um, transfer to the slide projection and present to you the, um, the program. I'll be providing with you a brief overview of the SABS as a national standards body. Subsequently, Robert Koch will provide us or enlighten us on the role of SANS 22301, which is security and resilience uh, um, business continuity management systems and other related standards in disaster management. 
This will be followed by Johan Oppermann, who will talk about the integrated approach to governance, risk, security, and resilience to protect and add value to the organizations. And last but not least, Dr. Netson Popiwa, who will talk about consumer experiences during the COVID-19 state of disaster in South Africa, implications for business continuity. Uh, we'll uh, subsequently have a panel discussion um, and uh, it'll be a Q&A session as well. And lastly, um, a closure of the, the program. Uh, I would kindly request um, the panelists to switch off their cameras. I think um, it will assist us to, to manage the connectivity issues and um, it allows for a smooth um, transition towards the presentations. I think I'll do that myself. So just a brief overview of um, the South African Bureau of Standards. Uh, we basically uh, have a legislated mandate um, and um, SABS was established by the Standards Act of 1945. And uh, the key focus of the organization is to develop, promote and maintain South African national standards, to promote quality with respect to commodities, products and services, for domestic and export markets, as well as provide conformity assessment services. And these are wide ranging from testing services of products to certification, product and system certification, to inspection and verification services. It's also important to note that SABS is part of the technical infrastructure uh, institutions. And so one of four technical infrastructure institutions the other three being the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications, the NRCS, and they are basically responsible for the administration of technical regulations. And this uh, purely is to ensure compliance uh, and protect human health uh, and safety. SANAS is the accreditation body of South Africa. It provides formal recognition to carry out specific tasks and ensures that certain bodies providing certification um, uh, protocols as well as um, uh, testing services have the right infrastructure to perform and meet the requisite uh, international standards. And lastly, the MISA underpins the testing and calibration through measurement accuracy and measurement traceability. All three entities are key for the efficient functioning of the economy and we try as far as possible to complement each other in administering our mandate. So standards, um, as you probably are aware, is it plays a very important role uh, in our daily lives. And both national and international standards, I think, um, um, plays the significant role from a socioeconomic perspective. And I think all of us will not be able to conceive life and the and the day to day activities without standards being implemented in all facets. Uh, of our workday, being it uh, social environments, including industrialization aspirations of the country. From a public sector perspective, uh, standards play an important role in terms of supporting um, regulations. Uh, they are not regulations per se, uh, they are for voluntary uptake and they certainly contribute towards supporting socioeconomic development. In the private sector, standards are critical to allow for access to markets, including uh, inclusive um, growth of industries, as well as providing competitive positioning in the marketplace by adhering um, to standards. Also increases the operational efficiencies of um, uh, industries and companies. From a consumer perspective, it allows for consumer safety. Consumers are involved in, um, a, in certain areas of development of national standards, and it provides an element of assurance. So standards support both basically the technical aspects, social aspects, and environmental aspects uh, towards sustainable development. They certainly reflect the state of the art, and this, they are a vehicle for the dissemination of new technologies, innovative practices, uh, as well as industrialization objectives. And certainly provides a major role in terms of assisting consumers uh, by informing their buying decisions so that they will be able to buy products that are fit for purpose and services that meet their requirements. Uh, 
From a global perspective, uh, we are uh, signatories to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the declaration thereof. All 17 goals play a very important role in various programs that government has put in place, as well as policy implementation. This is very closely aligned to the National Development Plan. Approximately 74% of the National Development Plan objectives as you can see um, uh, highlighted by the various pillars, all nine of them uh, are aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. One aspect of the National Development Plan, which is very critical towards the national standardization strategy, is developing uh, standards, South African national standards, in support of the national standardization strategy. And the various industrial priority sectors include mining, agriculture, industry, the various industrial sectors, tourism, high tech sectors, oceans economy. So the SABS is critical to make sure that our standardization strategy delivers uh, standards in support of all these key areas of policy and programs that support um, government's priority sectors. As pointed out, standards are knowledge and they represent an agreed way of addressing problems, uh, real and perceived problems uh, in society. They might be a wide variety of outcomes, uh, like today we're discussing management systems, so it's a management system standard. Uh, however, there are specifications, guidelines, characteristics to ensure products, services, processes are fit for purpose. Uh, it's very important to understand that they are for voluntary application and they developed according to international best practice. Um, and the stakeholders that participate in our standards development processes participate as members of technical committees, subcommittees and working groups, and the technical content comes from these industry uh, and various stakeholder expertise. We are a member of ISO and IEC. ISO is the International Organization for Standardization and IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission and as members, we are allowed to take these standards, adopt them as national standards, modify them to an extent based on WTO TBT rules. And the um, document that we abide by is WTO TBT Annex 3, which is the code of good practice for the preparation and application of standards. As pointed out, standards are not regulations. Regulatory authorities should Wherever possible, you make use of national standards in regulatory work. Regulatory authorities should also endeavor to apply references to standards um, as methods that respect their voluntary nature. Just uh, in terms of a brief summary of best practices. So we ensure a level playing field in the development of our national standards. And this is basically uh, includes a wide variety of principles, which is openness, transparency, market relevance, due process, coherence, consensus, and stakeholder engagement. These principles are all encompassed in our um, national norm, uh, and that provides the basis and the guideline for the development of national standards. We try as far as possible to make sure that we have a, a stakeholder balance so that all stakeholders have the opportunity to participate and provide technical content uh, in the development of national standards. This includes industry, government representatives, NGOs, consumer representatives, SMMEs, academia and labor organizations. The engine of the standards room are certainly the technical expertise that comes from these diverse range of stakeholder representatives. From a global perspective, I mentioned that we are members of ISO and IEC and it's critical that we influence um, ISO and IEC in terms of their development of the international standards. We also participate on strategic forums uh, to manage and maintain the objectives of these two international organizations. We also participate uh, at uh, regional organizations and key to um, the regional organizations from an African perspective is ARSO, which is the African Organization for Standardization, uh, including AFSEC, which is the African Electrotechnical Commission, and last but not least, the sub-regional body, which is Sadekstan. The key focus of these regional bodies and SABS's participation in these regional bodies is to harmonize standards, and this will allow and facilitate the um, um, implementation of the African continental free trade area. 
On a national basis, we have a collection of 7,400 South African national standards. On average, we publish about 250 standards um, annually. This is administered through 300 committees and the experts that participate in our committees are in excess of 1,700. I think it's important uh, to really understand that um, we can appreciate that uncertainty has never been more certain. There, this, and this has certainly has been clearly demonstrated by the COVID-19 global pandemic and the significant socioeconomic disruption that has and will continue to be felt throughout the world for some time. COVID-19 has exposed how unprepared we are to proactively plan and respond to disruptions. So there are a number of questions um, that needs to be asked amongst ourselves and society. And how do we engage with these? Two of them could be, what can we learn from the current pandemic? What ste steps can be taken to prepare for the future? And more importantly, how do we look towards overcoming this current wave? And this current wave is surely uh, of uh, as we continue with our various plans and programs to overcome the health issue uh, and the security issue. There are other bigger waves that's going uh, our way and in close proximity to us, which is the economic issue around recession and the bigger wave that still lingers over us as climate change plays an important role in shaping providing a huge amount of disruptive disruption in socioeconomic and environmental issues and how do we accommodate and plan to address these. So ladies and gentlemen, um, this is a brief introduction to the very important topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is security and resilience uh, and the standard 22301 business continuity management systems. With that, um, I would like to uh, introduce our first um, speaker, which is um, Mr. Robert Koch, and he'll enlighten us on SANS 22301 and other related standards in disaster management. Good morning, uh, colleagues. The uh, presentation I hope by now has come up. Um, I'll be speaking to um, SANS 22301, which sp speaks specifically to business continuity, um, something that uh, clearly is in the front of our minds right now with the COVID pandemic. But I'll be speaking more broadly about standards and disaster management and how we at ESCOM uh, pull it all together. So um, what I'll be doing is, is speaking to um, disaster resilience in particular, obviously resilience itself is a very wide topic, um, but for today uh, I'll be talking to that. I'd like to introduce the discussion by just speaking about uh, what it means to build re resilience with, res with regard to being able to respond to incidents. The image that you see in front of you, a very famous image, is that of the Deepwater Horizon incident, um, which out of interest could have been prevented by someone at the front line, but they didn't feel they had the um, the authority to take certain decisions at the time. So when one looks at disasters like this, both the, the prevention and the response, um, there's a lot that we don't want to leave up to chance. We don't want to flip a coin um, and hope for the best at the time. In fact, what happens with these kinds of disasters is that where we fail to provide resilience is where we have this momentary inability um, to cope with surprise or disruption. So in other words, uh, sometimes even some small decisions need to be made, but if we haven't established the ability to take those decisions, as in the case of this big uh, disaster, which um, caused major environmental damage in the um, uh, Gulf of Mexico at the time, um, then we have these kinds of disasters emerge. On the other hand, a successful building of resilience in this response usually um, addresses the ability to deal with surprise and disruption under pressure 
in order in in other words it's about decision making it's about having the resources available um, or if you don't have those resources about being able to pull those in uh, very rapidly through connections and the and the like so just a little bit of history in in in, in myself i started uh, getting involved with resilience in 2008 when ESCOM's management announced to the country that we effectively didn't know if we might have a national blackout because we were entering into a phase of load shedding. Um, as much as load shedding is um, a highly intrusive intervention at the moment, um, since then we've developed all the capability to do load shedding in a manner that doesn't put the power system at risk. In fact, you would have seen uh, we did stage six load shedding, which is way beyond where we were in 2008, and the system was was safe in the process of doing that, from safe from a national blackout. So what we do as well to prevent disasters, so I'm speaking about two disasters here. The one is the black national blackout, and the other one is uh, load shedding itself, and I'll come to that in a moment. But effectively, what we do in disaster prevention is um, we're looking at making sure that multiple barriers um, that would prevent a disaster from happening uh, are being managed. And obviously, standards play a critical role in this. So, for example, if we look at a, 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 the, the, a national blackout, um, multiple barriers are sitting there. So, for example, even now as we deal with the COVID in incident, uh, right up front we've got barriers related to protecting our staff from being infected, um, uh, significant compliance uh, focus on making sure that right across our generation fleet, our uh, 44,000 people are, 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 are being um, uh, taken through the process of ensuring that we don't uh, uh, have incidents. And where we do, obviously, our response plans and the like all feature as multiple barriers here. For those of you that recognize what I've illustrated here, this is in fact a, a Swiss cheese model. Uh, the premise is that every barrier becomes weak at some stage, but if you've got enough barriers and the integrity of those barriers are there, then you prevent a, a disaster. So having just done that very quick um, overview, I want to talk to decision making. So decision making is one of the key things when it comes to resilience, um, to being able to make decisions in a space that's sometimes really difficult. And the question is, what matters? And I'm going to um, focus on this very much as we go through the role of standards as well. So what matters firstly is, is context in decision making. Um, I'll add to that another thing that matters, which is context, and a third thing that matters, which is context. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, what I, with regard to uh, some of some of these uh, responses that we need to take. So let's take any disaster, and I think uh, our minds really been sharpened by the COVID-19 incident. We basically often sit with this feeling of confusion as to what's going around. Um, much of it we haven't experienced before. <clears throat> We're dealing with it for the first time. And to understand how decision makes, making happens in these spaces sometimes helps us to understand what's even happening around us. So for example, the initial stages of a major incident, and I must just point, there's just been a big incident at uh, Caltex uh, this morning, but you're dealing with this chaotic situation um, uh, that needs a certain kind of decision making. And in this space, the decision making is simply you make a decision. Um, you don't have time to analyze. You don't have time for many of these things. And a good example of this is the early decision to go into lockdown as a, as a country. Um, we know we, we already had some insight from what had happened in China, but the decision to rapidly go into lockdown allows one then to get into a place where you're dealing with the complexity of a disaster where you're watching patterns emerge, you're watching the data emerge, um, you're not able to analyze it in detail yet, but you're watching these patterns and you're responding to those patterns by taking certain interventions. Uh, then we get to the decision-making realm called complicated, and this is where we have the luxury of being able to analyze things, to be able to <clears throat> come up with uh, good practice um, and implement that, and then there are some areas in which the decisions are clear. So, for example, in the middle of a disaster, if you need to start up a generator, the instructions and the step-by-step -step standard operating procedure for starting up a, an emergency generator, that would fall into the category of clear. Um, those steps need to be followed in the order that they need to be followed, and obviously the, the role of standards in that space um, is, is crucial. 
So that gets me to this third element of what I want to speak about, which is the role of standards. So if we look at these three decision realms, <clears throat> what happens during chaos, uh, the early stages of a disaster typically um, uh, speak to that uh, area of chaos, uh, we have to apply novel practice. It's the first time we're doing this often. We might have done exercises in the past. We might have done many things, but the way something appears on the day is often very different to the way we imagined it would be. And it requires novel practice. And obviously in that space, um, we would have uh, developed the capabilities to make those decisions uh, rapidly. When we move from a complex realm to a complicated realm, that's the process of understanding how things tend to work and being able to put um, some of the best, uh, some good practice uh, in place. In other words, there's not a single best practice, but good practice. And again, standards play an essential role in this space. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if we get into the realm of clear, uh, we, we use best practice. A good example here is on the operating table, the counting of instruments um, during a, 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 an operation in a, in, in a medical context. Um, clearly best practice there is to make sure we're counting what goes in and what comes out of the person being operated. Um, now, I want to make one point just about standards, which um, is important, which is if we apply clear decision making uh, principles in the space of uh, potential chaos, uh, in, in spaces that it's not intended to be, we could in fact drop into chaos. And that's the danger sometimes of applying standards, um, what we refer to as in a tick box manner, just simply applying what's what's been written without thinking of those three words I mentioned earlier, which are context, context, context. Um, I've added a little illustration here, which has just come on the social media line, a very nice one, which takes us through these decision-making realms, which takes us out of the place of confusion, but being able to understand how chaotic, complex, complicated, and clear domains, um, how we need to make decisions in those. Um, so the importance here is to understand the role of standards, and I do need to emphasize uh, Many cases, all of these four domains are happening at the same time in a disaster. We, for example, have some massive trip on the power system and we're having to start up emergency generators. Um, those are two completely different domains and the training for, for people to do respond to those is very different, um, but it requires certain standardized approaches to it. So um, the ordered domain is the one where the role of standards is the most apparent and the clearest. Uh, and I'll be speaking to some of that in, in a moment, how we structure in ESCOM our disaster planning. So that structure uh, we, we refer to as preparing for disasters. So I'll be talking now about our preparation for disasters. Um, one of my favorite little clauses in the Disaster Management Act is the one that refers to what we do in preparing for disasters, which is we bear in mind the most vulnerable at any stage. Um, so the Act itself obviously has certain requirements for public sectors and for organs of state like ESCOM. And uh, we take this Act uh, very seriously. Uh, we have a disaster plan that we submit annually to the National Disaster Management Center, which is built on the principles that I'll take you through in a moment. So the plan itself has uh, three major areas. The one is the response structures, in other words, how we structure those. And of course, there's best practice and there's good practice in this space, which again comes to standards. We have an incident command system, which is how we connect, how we interconnect, and how we coordinate um, our response to a major disaster, as we are currently with the COVID pandemic. And then we talk about our contingency plans. I'll quickly speak to each of those three areas uh, for now. I want to make a, a point as well, which is um, <clears throat> our objective in ESCOM is to, to, to coordinate our planning for these major incidents across generation, transmission, distribution, and our customer services areas, as well as with our contractors and uh, some of our larger customers as well. <clears throat> we are also obviously looking at compliance to the Act, as I mentioned a moment ago. We currently have 11 uh, defined national disaster priorities in terms of the act we are required to identify those. We also have uh, multiple other disaster priorities at a provincial level and at a site level. So looking just at the national level, you'll 
you'll notice the list, and I won't go through it there at the moment, but the top ones there, a nuclear incident at Kuburg Power Station, a national blackout, a severe supply constraint, uh, which is where load shedding comes in, and then, of course, economic financial collapse at a country level or even at a, at a utility level. Um, out of interest, on the 11th of March, we um, internally we made history in the sense that uh, we had uh, three of these disaster plans triggered at the same time. On the 11th of March, we were doing stage four load shedding to protect the power system from a national blackout. We also, on the same day, had a major IT data system incident. Um, for those of you that are involved in business continuity management that have been through one of these, you'll, you'll know what that means. Um, and we were in the process of recovering IT systems which support our customer services functions, our finance functions and the, and the like. And we were already deep in the process of preparing for our COVID-19 response. We triggered our plan in uh, February already. Um, our, our plan involved at that stage going into full lockdown or the potential of a full lockdown of 10 and a half thousand uh, people needing to be on site on a daily basis, 12 and a half thousand people being ready for any contingency and of course uh, the, the, the rest of our staff working from home. So on the left hand side talking to contingency plans, we, uh, we talk about three types of plans. Disaster plans which relate to how we coordinate with other um, uh, between ourselves as well as with other uh, disaster responders like the national and provincial disaster response uh, structures. Business continuity plans, which is where uh, ISO uh, 22301 uh, plays the big role, which is how we keep our critical processes and functions operating during an incident. And then site level emergencies, how we deal with emergencies at a site level. We also have site level disaster plans, which really fits at the top. Uh, something like you might have noticed, we shut down the Camden power station because one of the things we do is monitor the integrity of things like our ash dams and we were not comfortable with the uh, state of one of our ash dams, so we shut down the power station in uh, to prevent a, 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 a local or a district level disaster of a, of, a, of a breakage of an ash dam wall. So this gives you an idea of how we need to structure these things. And so when you see my slides in a moment, they really address um, those elements. So responding to a disaster. When we respond to a disaster, um, we uh, currently use uh, an, an international system um, that was uh, promulgated in the US after the 9-11 incident. We essentially have an incident commander that oversees the response of our three major divisions um, supported by all the other divisions. Our group chief executive is not a member of that. Um, he becomes the client of this. Uh, we have the various elements brought up in the standard from making sure that safety, including nuclear safety, is addressed. The planning for that incident, the liaison with um, other responders and of course public communications in terms of our crisis communications process. And then we have the functions in the business um, that are responding uh, and the structures that deal with those, as well as we have our provincial structures which coordinate between our various functions at a provincial level. So this is a very high level picture of how we respond. Um, and these are the structures that we have in place to, to deal with that. This is what a uh, incident management uh, structure looks like for a major incident. This is in fact a, an illustration of a pandemic response. You'll see we have the uh, four major objectives there which are to support the national containment of the virus, uh, maintaining supply of electricity, the safety of our staff and contractors, and finally the support of the economic recovery which is the, um, obviously our focus at the moment. Um, and as you know, currently we're projecting um, less than three days of load shedding over winter in order to, to provide for that. Um, I won't go through the details of, of, the, of the structures themselves, but go on next up to how we do the planning, the coordination of disaster planning. And the way we do that is uh, there's a couple of standards. Uh, we use 22301 on the right hand side, SANS ISO 22301 from business continuity perspective. Um, we use ISO 31000 from a risk management perspective. We use NERS, uh, NRS 0489, which is a regulatory standard for um, how we respond to load shedding, for example. So what we have is the ESCOM disaster management plan uh, that talks to how everything integrates around a disaster. 
that plan is broken down into multiple contingency plans so at a national level those 11 disasters i spoke to those each speak to um, one of those contingency plans we obviously have a, a working group associated to each of those these plans address our preparedness our response and our recovery capabilities and right through the process we're applying sans 31000 uh, by focusing on our objectives around these disasters, by doing the assessments and looking at what treatment needs to be in place to address any controls that are not adequate at the time. And again, <clears throat> as context changes, we change those risk assessments. Again, coming to the point that context is continually changing. <clears throat> I spoke a moment ago about our institutional arrangements, which is the word that the Act uses, which is our incident command system, and I gave you a quick insight into that. We also have a detailed stakeholder plan. In other words, who we engage with. I have a list of stakeholders that I personally engage with from hospitals and uh, the responders in those spaces all the way to the disaster structures um, that I inf keep informed during any disaster. Coming then to the planning process, uh, we have a universe of response procedures, um, many of them based on 22301 and then other electricity specific requirements that we um, glean from other parts of the world. Um, this all eventually finds a space in a, in a country plan and when it comes to load shedding, and that's what I've used here, for example, the NRS 0489 um, regulation, uh, that deals with how we do load shedding in a way that least impacts um, critical things like hospitals, as well as protects the power system from a national blackout in a very uh, uh, um, uh, clear way. So when we look at um, business continuity, they business continuity plans are just one of the kinds of um, procedures that we use. We also have provincial disaster plans, site emergency plans, and then standard operating procedures from anything from deep cleansing of our control rooms now during COVID, um, to how we make decisions around when to load shed and on what stage uh, uh, to, to, to do that load shedding. Uh, we also report to our board. Um, in fact, we use that Swiss cheese model with a lot of detail below it to indicate where there might be current weaknesses in any of those barriers that need to be addressed uh, immediately or over the next period of time. <clears throat> Which brings me to the idea of disaster prevention. Um, in the prevention of a disaster, as I mentioned earlier, we have multiple dynamic uh, barriers. <clears throat> and this is in fact is what that dashboard looks like that we present to our board without obviously the detail underneath it at the moment. But our prevention of a national blackout in this case, you can see it deals with right up front with the construction of the power stations to how we operate the power stations, the transmission grid, uh, the system operator itself to how we deal with the emergencies. And you'll see the word manual there, that is load shedding, when we do a manual response to prevent a, a national blackout. And then we have multiple layers of automatic load shedding, which operates in a third of a second to prevent the power system uh, going into a national blackout, which probably is one of the biggest disasters that this country could experience, which is why we focus on it as much as we do and why load shedding is so essential to prevent it. Once we've had a national blackout, that is not the worst. The worst is if we fail to restore the power system afterwards. So we have multiple barriers around that. We island units, uh, keep some of the generation units running. Uh, we have the black start capability to restart those from a blackout. Uh, we look at the whole system, how we restore that. And then at a country level and at an ESCOM level, we have contingency plans. And if you look at again, how those standards play a role, I pointed out earlier NRS 048 is how, defines how we do manual load shedding um, right across this chain. Um, right now, for example, the COVID-19 incident speaks to pretty much all of these barriers as to um, uh, business continuity, how we make sure that these barriers are maintained during a, a disaster like the one we're experiencing right now. Which finally gets me to the role of standards. <clears throat> Uh, we're currently working just as one of our business areas with our uh, national system operator, probably one of the most critical parts of the of the system. Uh, we're working with 18 of the largest grid operators in the world to look at how we can uh, look at best practice and good practice. Uh, we're using uh, a, a framework developed by one of my colleagues as part of her PhD, which looks at how we uh, look at specified requirements, which is very much the space of standards at a technical level and at a social at a social level in this socio-technical system that we are operating. In other words, it's both people and technology that have to interrelate. 
and um, using multiple different standards and uh, focal areas there. We also look at general requirements in order to improve our social resilience and our technical resilience. And these are things that we could use for any disaster over and above the specific disaster that we're dealing with. And so given the time, um, in closing, I'm going to just speak to some of my main conclusions around the presentation I've just made. Um, one of the issues sometimes when you're working in organizations as, as big as ours, perhaps, <clears throat> is to understand where people are in terms of under, um, understanding the role of resilience, the role of business continuity, the role of emergency planning. Um, we have a real benefit right now with the pandemic. Everything is becoming visible as to why these things are essential. Uh, we use this little illustration on the left in our training to talk to the point of um, understanding that, you know, business continuity planning is not just conspiracy theory. It's not as if these things will never happen. In fact, I've just illustrated a moment ago how on the 11th of March, three of our disasters happened simultaneously. And how important it is that we understand the context and be able to apply those decisions wisely. And, and that's the one just before it. <clears throat> so in conclusion, standards play a vital role in building resilience. Um, which obviously includes disaster management. It's much wider resilience, the idea of resilience, but uh, in, in disaster management. The concern here is we can have a false sense of security. We can tick the boxes, so we've done the exercises. In fact, we tend not to do exercises um, by following the steps in a business continuity plan. We throw very intriguing scenarios at teams, so they're having to use those business continuity plans to respond in ways that they hadn't potentially thought of doing that. Uh, standards also provide a very important common language and approach across various parts of the business. So when we're talking about certain things, we're talking about the same thing. When we talk about a, a <clears throat> return, a, a recovery a point objective or a time of objective in the business continuity space, we're talking about the same concept. If deployed well, Standards can provide scaffolding for fostering essential components of resilience. In other words, if we think very carefully about how we're using the standards, they can help us um, develop the imagination of what it might look like to be in a disaster that we haven't been, been before. And very importantly, to defer some of the decision making to the front line. Um, the disaster I started out with, the, one of the big failures was the inability for the front line to make a cru crucial decision. And standards help us to do that. In other words, if we provide the, the context in which someone can make a decision, we can prevent or respond better to disasters. Also importantly is that most resilient organizations are those who experience small failures. In other words, who are picking up all the time on issues that happen that could have had worse results and learning from them. The example I gave earlier, 2008, as, as much as the load shedding looked bad, it could have been much worse given the fact that our load shedding at that stage hadn't been uh, constructed in a way that uh, we could guarantee or at least give a high sense of security around the national system not going into a blackout. And finally, standards play one part in institutionalizing this learning. So once we've taken that learning, we build it back not only into company standards, but uh, the NRA standard we build back. We're currently in our uh, third edition of that um, to build the learning of a load shedding into that. And then uh, this obviously at a national level could contribute significantly to societal resilience. And we'll be um, obviously hearing from some of the other speakers on, on the whole notion of a country becoming more resilient. So uh, that is my presentation. Thank you very much. I, I hope I've been able to shed some light or at least open the discussion in this space. I could just end with a quote here. <clears throat> it's my favorite quote, which is from Rebecca Solnit. She says, uh, when you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcome. To embrace the unknown and the unknowable is an alternative to the certainty of optimists and pessimists. In other words, people who say, well, it'll all go wrong or pessimists, uh, uh, optimists who say everything will be fine or pessimists that keep saying, well, everything is going wrong or will go wrong. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Robert. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to receive a very enlightening presentation on, on the ESCOM perspective of, of disaster management. What is very clear from your presentation 
as uh, decision making and decision making within context. And that is you know, a, one of the key take home messages, because as you pointed out, there are different realms that are at play, being it complex, complicated, you mentioned chaotic, clear, and some of them might be experienced um, all at the same time. And there lies the challenge as well. Uh, the important role of standards as uh, as part of good practice, um, and other aspects, best practice and, and, and novel practices as well. But um, one other point that clearly um, brings to my attention is that the application of standards should be a tick box exercise. Uh, you quite rightly uh, uh, said that it has to be applied in context and we need to make sure that these plans relevant, uh, implementable, and there's ongoing monitoring and evaluation of these plans. Uh, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate the presentation. I trust that we'll get some comments uh, at the latter part of the um, of the webinar. Just, uh, I uh, I must apologize. I should have introduced Robert earlier on, but I'm, uh, I'm going to do that right now, post his presentation. Uh, Robert heads up the Eskom Enterprise Resilience function. Uh, he has coordinated responses to major incidents since 2008. Uh, he's a recipient of the IEC 1906 award. It's a very prestigious award. Um, and um, this is for his role in leading the development of the international of international standards uh, in the electricity industry. Uh, his interest lies in complex adaptive systems, resilience thinking, and real-time learning. So, Robert, uh, thank you, and I appreciate your contribution. I'm going to move on to um, our next presenter, which is Johan Oppermann. Johan is uh, the CEO of the consulting firm Risco. Uh, he provides specialist consulting, independent audit and training services in governance, risk strategy, um, and performance management. Uh, he holds an, uh, an MBL. Uh, he's a certified director at IOTSA. Um, uh, also a certified ISO 31000 senior risk manager. He's a member of the SABS TC262 risk management and uh, TC309 governance in organizations. Um, welcome, uh, Johan, and uh, I'll now hand over the floor to yourself. Thank you, Sadvin. I just would like to confirm whether you can see the screen. Yes, we can. You just want to put it in presentation mode? Yes. Sure. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way to start uh, when we start talking about integration as to reflect the South African flag there as well, because that is actually the ultimate uh, integration that we're talking about. And it's also reflective of a strategic level that we would like to get the integration, but the strategic levels are only possible if you really uh, look at the all levels down to the operational side as well. So we'll be looking at the integration, uh, integrated approach for governance, risk and security and the resilience management to protect and add value. When we talk about the resilience management, then of course we will also be referring to uh, actually performance management. I'm going to look at a uh, high level, three levels, uh, th three points. Uh, we're going to have to look at introduction of, of, of terminology very briefly, but then looking at the corporate governance and the main generic board roles, uh, yeah, they will be referring to uh, corporate governance code and King 4, of course, the South African code is very important there as well. Uh, and then lastly, we're looking at the integrated uh, governance risk strategy resilience um, uh, uh, approach. And, and it's from a practical perspective, um, and we're going to refer to this respective designs in their standards. So what we see as risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. It is both a positive as well as a negative. I'm not going to go into more detail there, but it's closely related to, to, to strategy. And the strategy is the method and plan chosen to bring about desired failure of a future, uh, such as achievement of a goal or solution to a problem. It's an art and science of planning and marshalling resources for the most efficient and effective use. A business continuity, on the other hand, is uh, the capability of the organization to continue delivery of products and services at acceptable predefined levels. And Chris has referred to that extensively uh, earlier. 
But very interesting, I would like to refer to ISO 24762, Disaster Recovery, where it's recognized that uh, uh, business continuity management is part of holistic risk management uh, process. And when we say holistic, it means that different portions of the different participating parts have to effectively uh, communicate and interact with, with one another. And then, of course, uh, resilience is, re is referred to as uh, advancing despite adversity. Now, the interesting stuff from my perspective, very keen interest in the corporate governance. So what do we mean by corporate governance? Uh, it refers to the exercise of ethical and effective leadership by the governing body or the board uh, towards the achievement of following the outcomes. So I'm not going to go into everything there. I would like to highlight, however, the ethical culture, which is very important, and especially in the South Africa concept, but then also good performance. Now, we indicated that there's two participating parts there. The one is the ethical side, the other one is the effective leadership side. And I would like to just see what do we mean by effective leadership? Because many a time there is a problem and people uh, do not want to embrace for some reason uh, a governance and corporate governance because they see that as uh, equating to red tape a very slow moving view, maybe accurate in the end, but very slow moving whilst we need some agility as part of the process. So let's clear that up. The effective leadership is results driven. In other words, we need to achieve what we set out to be achieved. Otherwise, you know, this is supportive by, by, by uh, governance. And it's about achieving strategic objectives and positive outcomes. And then lastly, there's, it includes but goes beyond an internal focus on effective and efficient e execution. So it's not the slow moving wheel grinding eventually to get there. It should be efficient as well. That is the internal requirement. Now, I, last portion there, I just would like to con uh, consider the four high level uh, roles of a board of directors. And the reason for doing that is I'm gonna link it to the standards. I'm gonna address the ISO 31000 risk management standard uh, next. And then I'm gonna link that again to the ISO 22301. Now, the first overall responsibility of a board is to steer and set direction uh, of a company. And the second one is then to approve policy and planning to give effect to strategy and set the direction. So in order to get that right, the board must also see and oversee the, and monitor the implementation and what is happening in the organization to make sure whatever they set out to achieve is in fact achieved. So there's a definitely an element of performance management uh, in there as well. And then lastly, ensures accountability for performance. And I would like to highlight, you know, there's a planning element here, there's an execution element and a monitoring and improvement element, and that cannot happen without the accountability of performance. So this is not unique to corporate governance. When you look at ISO 31000, which I typically refer to as risk management on a page, uh, there are three balls, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail there, very high level. The first circle there on top of it constitutes the principles that you have to achieve uh, from an overall risk management perspective, otherwise you're not going to uh, meet the objectives of it. That's critical that you achieve those specific points. But then the core focus of risk management, in the middle you stated there, that's a, it's for value creation and value protection both the protection side and, 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 and the, and the, and the crea value creation side. The risk management is not only on the right hand side and on the bottom, the risk management process, that's a critical process here yeah, of sure, but it is, it is one of the parts. The area that I would like to concentrate now on is uh, the framework indicated over here, and that is designed for integrating risk management into the business pro uh, processes. The risk management, as you will see, is very closely related. We have to integrate it into the strategy processes, but we also have to make sure that there's effective coordination and integration with all the different risk types that we're talking about. Now, this framework here, the left hand side and the bottom, is designed specifically to do so. You can see there's a specific reference to uh, integration there as well. But then I would like to come to the areas that, uh, that we've dealt with earlier as well. The, the, the famous design area, the implementation, the evaluation, and the improvement side. And we can also equate it to the Plan Do Check Act. 
mechanism that might be more familiar uh, to you. So the point here is in the risk management program, there's a specific portion that is designed to consider the effect of integration to increase the effectiveness and the efficiency of what we're busy to do. All right, now we take the, the framework on the left-hand side. It's exactly the same one that we discussed on left and bottom side in the previous page. And then I've taken basically a, 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 a diagram of ISO 22301. Now, you, you might argue with me that this specific diagram is not in the latest version, but when you go into the wording of that, you can see exactly they're referring to the plan you checked at uh, a portion. So that I would like to equate that. Now, if you look at ISO 31000, the design step there, it equates to a certain area on the business continuity side, and that is establish the plan. And now there's a lot of detail uh, 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 beyond that, and the purpose of this discussion, of course, is not really to go into that uh, detail. So there is a direct correlation between design phase in risk management and establish, and the, the planning phase in ISO 31000. So we can go on, and we've color coded that. Uh, the next phase there is implementation. That is the do phase, and that equates to the implement and operate of ISO 22301. And similarly, the evaluation or the check or study from a, from a risk management perspective equates again to the monitor and review portion of ISO 22301. Improvement equates to maintain and improve, but also that specific portion there, continuous improvement of the business continuity standards and so forth. What is very important there is nowadays we have to specialize. We, we, we we're living in a very complicated area, so we have to specialize. But we have to bring all those specialist uh, uh, areas in into one umbrella. You cannot have and create a number of silos and think you will be successful in terms of managing of an organization. From a strategic management perspective, from a risk management perspective, and from a business continuity perspective as well. One of the critical aspects is that you are successful in effectively managing across these silos. So this is a type of a new specialist area. You've got the, spilo, the, the, the specialist silos, but you have to bring them together and to be competitive. You have to see what are we doing in all these different areas that are duplications and that is happening in isolation. Now, typically, what we can see is from a strategy perspective, there are certain actions, and we will deal, deal with it on the next, next page as well. From a risk management perspective and the different risk types, they all have to do certain uh, things that are exactly the, the same, but they are concentrating that in terms of the specific standard. Let's go there to the next slide. Okay, the main integration uh, uh, points that we are referring to there in, in corporate governance, in risk management and in ISO 22301, business continuity, and the other standards as well. They start off with design, there's both the strategic framework and the operational processes. There's strategic processes in, involved that you have to consider, and part of that is the design of the operational processes, and you have to bring the two together. Then you have to, to look at uh, the context analysis, and Chris also referred to context as, as being important this, this, this morning. But the context that we're talking about here is the context of the organization, but then also the context of the specific area that we're looking at. So the internal context and the external context are very important. You need to know what is happening on the outside, what might impact you, and you have to pick up proactively on that before it's gonna hit you to see what you can do from a proactive uh, perspective. From the internal side, you look at your structures, you look at your strategy. And the strategy side, of course, is very important. You will see always in the strategy process, there's environmental analysis. Now the environmental analysis is also part of risk management, is also part of the business continuity side. So why do you have in an organization three different processes that's actually the same process? Use the same 
intention, but you do it three times with different role players. You will never get an element of consistency if you do that because they're different role players, they've got different worldviews, and they inform it from their specific worldview. Why don't you do an environmental analysis from a strategy perspective, bring in the risk people, bring in the business continuity people, and work on an environmental analysis? You will never get a 100% scenario there, but you might have an 80% common point of truth. And then you can just add the additional 10 or 5 or 15% to whatever the situation is and applicable to the specific standard. Then you will be able to do things quicker. You will have a single point of truth and you can refer to a common level of truth. Then stakeholder analysis. Again, Robert referred to stakeholder analysis importance and he's got direct communications associated with that. Stakeholder analysis is not only important from a strategy perspective, from an overall governance perspective. We've got different layers and different disciplines and so forth, and there are internal and external stakeholders that we have to, to consider. This is also an element that you can actually join forces to a serious extent and, and arrive at the, at the, the overall uh, stakeholder analysis for the company within portions then that can be added from a specific government uh, 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 standard perspective. So, so here you can see already things that are duplicated that you effectively coordinate with that. You can build both the effectiveness as well as the efficiency associated with that. Okay, all of these areas must have uh, of policies. That is, when you refer to the, strategy, uh, the, the governance portion, it is the policy and the setting of the direction that should be implemented and, uh, and so forth. So there are common designs there. What we cannot afford is, you can imagine if you sit on a board and you receive a strategy or a corporate governance framework or a risk management framework or a business continuity framework, and you have to consider that, then you quickly pick up that there are different views in terms of terminologies and so forth. Then you can immediately sense that there's going to be a significant amount of inefficiency uh, in, involved in this process. So the effect of coordination of all these disciplines, therefore, just very important as, as well. So we have to make sure that where we delegate the individual roles of, of, of people, and that we do it in such a way that we effectively consider the integration. Uh, we have to make sure that the information flows are flowing to wherever it is relevant and not only in a specific silo, because that is where you, you can take the proactive decisions if the people do have the correct information to take those decisions. But also in terms of reporting, um, ultimately, the board would like to see an integrated view. From a risk management perspective, you would like to see an integrated view of the aspects that might impact your ability to meet your objectives. And you would like to have an integrated view as well from a business continuity perspective. So see and be continuous on a lookout for areas whereby you can identify and optimize the synergies. And, and that is then something that you can feed in into the organizational processes, your methods and tools that you're using. The tech tools as a technology. You will never get technology that can accommodate all the governance for all the risk and all the uh, business continuity stuff. But there could be areas whereby you can combine it and again get a single point of truth that the others can feed off from. So when you design these, that you take the end goal into mind and then work backwards in, in, in terms of your process design in order to, to optimize that. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, and from a performance perspective, um, and, I, and I've indicated both performance indicators as well as risk indi in indicators, but really I would like to refer to key indicators rather, because if you measure a performance indicator, and the performance indicator gives you a view that there is a problem, you're not going to meet your objective, then of course it's automatically part of the risk uh, uh, risk uh, responsibility as well, and, and, and it concerns the risk management to, 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 to kick in there. Certain decisions to be made, uh, whether you need to throw in the resources in order to make that, or you look at your strategy and say, okay, this is not feasible. We have to um, you really change and th uh, think what we would like to achieve. But these things must happen dynamically. 
This cannot happen necessarily on an annual basis where we consider these things. Your continuous information flow is your management information that you really need to take your decision. Therefore, it's closely linked to the oversight and reporting. So by far are we gone, are, are those days gone that we can sit on a quarterly basis, we prepare reporting for the board or for EXCO and so forth, and this is, that is it. You, you, of course, you need to do that, but you need to report in such a way and operate in such a way that you're addressing these things on an absolute continuous basis. And when you report, you have to report not on what has happened. There's an element of that in terms of incident management and the lessons that you could learn from that. But then, of course, what is the current situation, but with a forward-looking view. That forward-looking view is going to uh, uh, result in decision making to prevent you from hitting the iceberg. So we've addressed the communications, internal and external communication uh, processes and the links to external stakeholders, internal stakeholders as, as, as well. And we've referred to the integration of the processes, a, a holistic view in terms of the integrators and processes. So in the ess uh, an essence of time, that is where I'm going to stop now. And maybe if there's additional questions in terms of practical integration and so forth, we can address it at the later stage. Thank you. Thank you, um, Johan. Uh, and thank you for a very interesting presentation around um, the management system standards, um, specifically, you know, the general principles of plan, do, check, act, but more importantly, the interrelationships between the management system standards. Risk underpins everything. Um, as pointed out, 31, the SANS 31000 is a very important standard that underpins a lot of the management system standards that are out there in the marketplace and serves the purpose to address specific areas. Uh, in, you mentioned integration uh, of requirements and coordination, um, and that's a key and critical point that needs to be understood as well and implemented uh, or should have been, uh, should be at top of mind, including government governance frameworks. Uh, regarding implementation of these various management system standards. Um, thank you, Johan. I'll uh, now move on to um, Dr. Netson Popiwa, um, just to briefly introduce um, uh, Dr. Netson as he prepares for his um, presentation. Um, I think, Johan, if you could um, unshare your presentation and uh, uh, Dr. Netson will be able to share his presentation. Um, so, um, Dr. Popiwa is a senior researcher at the uh, National Consumer Commission. Uh, the past decade, he has been involved in numerous academic and policy focused research and evaluation uh, projects uh, with South Africa and the and the broader region. That's uh, my hometown. Published um, several peer-reviewed publications, and um, his presentation today is part of a, a broader research project on uh, socio-economic impact on consumer in South Africa. Uh, thank you and welcome, Dr. Powi. I'd like to now hand over for your presentation. Thank you, Sadhu. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, good morning to you colleagues. Um, my presentation today will look at um, what we saw as the consumer experiences during uh, this whole time of the um, COVID-19 disaster. And what we are going to discuss this morning is just to reflect on after all that we have observed, what then could be the implications um, for business continuity. Now, you will admit that indeed, one of the things that COVID-19 has done is really to disrupt uh, consumers. 
at a global scale, at a regional scale and locally. And this has happened in several ways. Now you will see that just in terms of consumers' rights to access goods and services, this has really been something that has been affected, particularly because of regulations that have come in place in order to curb the spread of the virus. Now, which areas of um, regulation can we really reflect on? I think some of them which you are all uh, beginning to get used to are regulations are around time. Whereas we could shop till maybe um, 8 p.m. sometimes, or maybe 3 a.m. if it's Black Friday. Now, lately, shopping hours are subject to restrictions as a way to just curb um, the spread of the virus. Now, a negative aspect that most consumers have been complaining about is the unfair increase of prices uh, as retailers, particularly at the beginning, um, of the pandemic, retailers tried as much as they could to cash in on shortages and panic buying. I think um, in the NCC, some of the calls that we have been getting it, uh, right at the onset of the lockdown around 29, 30 March and so on, were around, for example, prices of uh, dust masks, which were going as far as I think one pharmacy in Sanin was selling them for 100 runs um just one mask but eventually now we see that prices have gone down but we've also seen the role of the consumer commission as well as the um, competition commission in actually uh, bringing to book some of these suppliers affordability has been one of the biggest issues as well consumers cannot afford even the basics and i think one of the reasons why affordability has become an issue is not just only because of price but also because of increased consumption of food and other groceries as people stay indoors. I think a lot of people have been uh, even making memes about the fact that um, their budget for fuel has gone down drastically, but their budget for uh, grocery items has really increased. Now, we also see shortages in goods that come from other parts of the world. Uh, these have become um, limited um, in supply. Um, I think in some cases, retailers will tell you that we normally import this particular um, product. That is why you can't find it on the shop floors. Um, the other aspect is expired goods. Um, reports, particularly on Spaza owners, selling expired foods has been quite one of the issues. The other issue is the issue of quality. Um, consumers have reported inferiority of certain products that are on the shelves. In some cases, because the product that you're used to using is in short supply, then um, in the end, you find that you only have to resort to the lesser or cheaper brands, which are, might also be cheap in terms of quality. Obviously, the lockdown has led to bans on accessing certain goods. Um, I think cigarettes are just one of those very thorny ones, which we have seen quite uh, a very big uh, issue around. Um, but uh, the lockdown brings in opportunities for retailers and other suppliers because online shopping has become the norm and not only an option. But we also see that data and by data I'm referring to um, um, your cell phone data for accessing internet has literally become the next essential. Uh, it has moved from essential to critical as you have to have data for you to be able to participate, be it in a social space. It might be religious space or it might be work environment. For you to work, you have to work online. For you to even attend a service, you have to do that online. So a lot has really changed. Now, in terms of also what we are picking up as, um, I want to go to the next slide. Oh, my. Um, can you hear me? I'm unable to change slides. Sure, Nitsen. Um, I can hear you. Um, OK. Are you still right. experiencing the problem? It's no, it's great right. now. OK, thank you. So the other sad reality, though, is that these disruptions to normal consumption have widened the gap between the haves and the have-nots in Africa. 
And the level four restrictions, if you look at them, and now level three, and even going as we continue to um, open up, we realize that they still favor those who own, for example, cars, or those who can buy fast food via the drive through route. So if you were to contrast the pictures in this uh, slide, you will see that there is a sense in which others will not even practice social distancing, will be subjected to certain um, uh, control measures that sometimes are inhumane. And this is simply because of um, loca location and, and uh, density and so on. And these are issues that COVID-19 uh, has never prepared us for and our responses are quite critical. Um, if the police itself, for example, in public order policing, you would really realize that they probably are overlooking some of these uh, risk management processes that we are talking about this morning. We also see that those with access to internet or mobile phone apps can actually shop for goods online, but not everybody has access to this. Now, I just wanted to reflect on evidence that's coming from research on South African consumer sentiments. Um, and I want to make reference to the McKinsey survey, which has really been looking at South African consumer sentiment during the coronavirus crisis, um, uh, which was done in May. Some of the key issues that emerged is that a majority of consumers are feeling the financial impact of the crisis, and they are really cutting back on, uh, on spending. The overall sentiment there, you will see that um, people, for example, those who feel that they are held or their friend's health has been negatively affected, they are also in quite a large number, about 40% of them. And if you add the somewhat disagree, also the numbers even go up, maybe to 74. Others also feel that their jobs are less secure than before because of COVID-19. And you also see that um, a majority of them really strongly agree that you know what, income has negatively been affected, about 62%. And their ability to work has also been reduced by the virus, about 63%. So there's a whole lot um, of responses from those consumers, which includes cutting back on their spending. You also find that consumers are, telling, are also saying that they have to be very careful about how they spend their money. And just look at that 87% who strongly agree, not only just agree, but really strongly agree that they really need to be very careful how they spend their money. We didn't see some of this earlier on, but lately we see that consumers are really paying attention. The other aspect is that nearly three quarters um, of consumers have de experienced a decline in their income and savings during the past, um, the first two weeks of the lockdown you will see that household spending has literally been affected. And if you look, for example, at those who feel that um, in, 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 in the March, what is it? March 23 to 26, at least they, the figures were still low. But when you go to March 23 to about April 21 to 24, you begin to see that two week lag time that then you have people really feeling the pinch to say that, um, they have seen an increase, which is quite a lot in some cases, of um, spending on household expenses, and therefore that has affected their savings. And then you see that the table, the graph on household savings also shows that quite a number of them also have seen um, that it has reduced a lot. If you look at that 73% in April 21 to 24. So then that shows you um, that indeed consumers were feeling that pinch. Now, consumer sentiment about the state of the economy, public health, uncertainty about the duration of the situation, these are actually the top concerns for most of the consumers or most of the South Africans. Because if you look at it, just look at how people feel very concerned about the economy. They feel very concerned about overall public health. In fact, they uh, feel that they don't know how long the situation will last. So you will see that a large number of them are, are really concerned about health, about taking care of their family, about the safety of their family. Safety when it comes to safety in this case refers to um, not contracting the virus. And also you see that um, very little, or at least the least concern is on upcoming events. So the fact that people had tickets for a certain show or a concert 
is not as um, hectic for them or as a problem for them as it is when it comes to the actual overall economy. So this is quite telling about what people really prioritize and what really people feel about. Now, more than half of the consumers have shopped at new stores and websites and most expect to continue doing so after the crisis. So the talk about a new normal or the next normal is sort of something that is uh, weighing in on many people. Um, you will see that there is a significant number who have switched to discount store for basics or shopped at a new grocery store. You, you also see that some 43% or 55% in the case of new websites as basics, they intend to continue with uh, shopping in that way. So there is that uh, likelihood that people will sort of stick to what they are getting used to. Now, consumers expect to reduce in-person activities such as shopping in-store, travel, movies and events. And such kind of statistics are important even for those in the businesses that are with in-store or that are in travel, movies and events because they need to pay attention to the fact that if they cannot reach consumers by consumers simply getting traveling to them, then they'll have to find ways of um, innovating in ways that make sure that at least consumers continue to be, uh, they continue to have um, consumers. Just look at how many are saying that they will not go to um, physical stores. You're looking at 30% of them saying a decrease and about 51% saying they'll stay the same. But if you look at those who want to go to movies and concerts, it's like 44%. So Stay, Kineco and many of these other uh, companies would really need to uh, really think um, what exactly will they do to uh, continue to attract the number that's attracted. Now, the personal and financial impact of COVID-19, many felt that it was going to uh, last well beyond uh, two months. Some were saying that the adjustment to their uh, routines will take them more than one year, and that's like 20%, which is significant. And seven to 12 months, four to six months, you see there the numbers. In total, 90% believe it will take two months plus before routines can return to normal. But that is just a survey done in May. And think about now that can people really think that the normal will return? That needs to be a follow up survey, obviously. And then if you look at the um, impact on personal household finances more than a year, most of the people, 89% believe their finances uh, will be impacted for two for more than two months by this um, particular pandemic. Now, Protecting consumers' rights under this lockdown is something that is very important. And for us as a commission, I just wanted to uh, lay out that there is a policy landscape that we have been really following through. Now, right on the eve of lockdown, when we were invited to make submissions by the Department of Trade and the Industry, the NCC, uh, as well as the Competition Commission, were quite keen on reflecting and uh, indicating to the minister that price gouging was going to happen because suppliers were going to seek to profit here from desperate consumers. Because already when there were rumors of lockdown, I think you remember some of the images from large retailers like uh, Macro, where you had uh, panic buying of essential goods and services, people already being, uh, uh, buying uh, sanitizers and so on, and foodstuffs, and even remember the tissues and so on, people wondering what uh, that rush was all about. So the NCC made a submission that it, it was of a view that panic buying would result in suppliers abruptly increasing prices and vulnerable consumers also not having access to essential goods and services. So this led to uh, discussions which then promulgated the Regulation 350 or Regulation 350 as we normally call it by the Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition. Now in some oh, NCC itself set up a toll free number uh, our 0800 num uh, f uh, telephone line. We set up a Twitter account for COVID related complaints, particularly those that speak to price gouging. And then just by between the 28th of March and the 3rd of April, we ran public awareness campaigns on SABC's radio stations to just alert consumers about that toll free number. And just between 23 March and the 8th of May, we received a total of 2,825 calls on that COVID-19 toll-free hotline. 
uh, of those 2,458, um, 1,582 complaints were related to price gouging. Now, the 876 complaints were not related to the regulation, um, uh, but there were complaints on other matters. I just want to say that because I also took time to mend that call center with my colleagues, sometimes these 876 complaints that came in through which were not relevant to price gouging, were also relevant to consumers' fears about other things. They were, for example, the food parcels, calls about where to get food parcels, calls about um, people reporting that people are not respecting lockdown in my area, uh, where can I report this, and even some calls about uh, sales of alcohol and cigarettes. What was even interesting was when consumers called in and said, I want to report my neighbor, he is selling uh, castle light for 70 runs a dumpy and we had to tell them that but we cannot register that as a complaint because they are selling something that is banned under this particular uh, lockdown. So we have been investigating these complaints and we have filed some of them with the National Consumer Tribunal. Um, I just a quick one on what the trends have been. So if you look at um, at the beginning of the of the of the of the pandemic uh, but the lockdown itself you will see that face masks and uh, gloves for example were quite um, the, the numbers were reasonably high and then you also see that the basic foods 43 percent that was quite um, a, a big concern for consumers but when you move on to april you see that uh, face masks face masks uh, related complaints began to drop to 18 percent um, sanitizers 8% and gloves 1% and basic foods became the real issues but that also includes hygiene products your your other grocery items began to be the, the key things that people complained about and lately now again in May it was now basic foodstuffs um, your face masks still did get complaints and sanitizers but generally uh, protective equipment complaints really dropped in in, in number now, what have been some of our challenges as a commission in enforcing Regulation 350 and in bringing justice to consumers during this period? You will see that although consumers in rural areas were calling that toll-free number to file complaints in the beginning, uh, the numbers of complaints from rural areas began to reduce. But I must at least, uh, um, at least acknowledge that um, those complaints were quite in number at the, at the onset of the, of the lockdown. But again, not all consumers in townships and rural areas fully benefited from regulated prices. Because as you know, the, most, uh, the closest suppliers of goods and, of goods and services in informal, in, in informal settlements, in townships and rural areas are actually spaza traders or shop uh, informal traders. And if your local spaza is um, selling uh, for very high price is selling at very high prices as a commission we cannot serve them with investigation certificates because that is part of the law that we apply we cannot give them uh, because they're not also registered as businesses they don't have email addresses they don't have formal contact details even the consumers themselves when they were phoning in their complaints were usually to say you know my local spaza when you say what is the address they also could not tell you the address of that spaza because sometimes not ad addresses don't work in the same way that we think they would work also the filing requirements for the tribunal itself they are very onerous and um, we as the NCC were still required to ask the supplier to agree to be served through email and some uh, suppliers buy time uh, to accede to our request and in so doing they frustrate the process. Um, I thought I should just say in, 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 in closing this uh, discussion is to also reflect um, on, on what implications the few things that I've reflected on have for business continuity. I think the next normal requires adapting business operations in ways which can continue uh, relatively uninterrupted. Uninter but of course, there has to be a balance between continuing business, not necessarily as usual, or continuing business in an uninterrupted way, but mitigating the spread of COVID. We also require adapting consumer-centered business continuity, which then leaves no consumers behind. And 
like I already indicated, if you are going to say people should buy through a drive through and not walk in, and that is before the restaurants opened up, you would then basically leave out a certain consumer who um, might not have access to a motor vehicle. So that is something that was actually happening during this lockdown. We also see that business to consumers will need to focus on providing goods and services to consumers regardless of where they live. So the critical question would then be what would your business do to reach out to certain consumers regardless of where they live? I think contact, contactless operations will be the norm. That's the only way uh, for us to continue to, to, to keep the numbers down, yet uh, even though we see that they are spiraling. But I think hardships will also force consumers to reprioritize their needs to serve. So suppliers need to be ready to adjust. Suppliers need to be cautious of exactly what consumers want. Although the past surveys have shown a high preference for shopping malls by consumers in South Africa, a post COVID-19 really could be a different experience. So will all this investment in real estate, uh, particularly when it comes to malls and so on, be the way to do it? So cheaper ways to shop online will be high priority. For example, data free websites. These are some of the things that uh, business can 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 actually consider. I'm going to stop here and um, take questions where they arise, but I just thought that maybe this is a reflection that we could do on what we as a commission have been realizing to be some of the challenges um, that consumers are facing. And just a few pointers on what we feel business could really look into. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Netson. Um, and once again, thank you for a very interesting um, presentation on uh, the challenges facing consumers consumer sentiment sentiments based on uh, the various um, surveys that you've conducted um, and basically their, their experience uh, on, on the COVID-19 situation. Issues around price gouging, which is an important factor that needs to take be taken into consideration. Um, you pointed out that the literally more than 50% of, um, of complaints um, that received uh, in the month, one of the months, was um, around price gouging. So it's a serious issue that, um, especially the marginalised communities uh, that are faced with, and, and how the Consumer Commission will be able to to address um, these issues. I think work from home uh, is an important point as raised. I think majority of us um, are working from home, and uh, we have, uh, you know, the the minimal infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, to do that. Um, the, the next area of um, significant progress and leapfrogging would certainly be uh, around digital transformation and uh, companies uh, big and small uh, will link to them to really embracing this area of, uh, of enhancements. Um, I would like to also um, remind um, participants um, that there is a question and answer um, icon uh, functionality as part of the webinar. You're more than welcome to submit comments or questions to uh, the panelists. Um, I would also, I see there is a, um, a comment uh, which I'll get to uh, briefly, but um, I would like to firstly thank the, the speakers um, for contributing towards this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm sure we will have a few moments of discussions as well as uh, a few question and answers, uh, which I would uh, pose to the um, to the presenters as well. Um, I know we will be uh, cautious of time as well, so we'll try as efficiently to manage the time that's uh, available to us. So the comment um, that is on um, that has been put forward is that uh, there is no doubt in my mind. Um, Standards are important. in my mind. They need, to, especially if they can, that they are empowering and improving efficiency. Um, thank you um, for that comment. I think it's uh, at uh, in different perspectives. Uh, I'll speak to it um, from a standards perspective um, in terms of the national standards body. Um, so. A national standards body, like any national standards body in a country, 
uh, will develop standards um, for voluntary application. Uh, and this is specifically to allow for they become compulsory or mandatory when there is a clear evidence that there's market failure, meaning those standards are not implemented rightly or it's not seeking, it hasn't, upon implementation, it hasn't seek to achieve the desired objective. Uh, and it impacts on the safety and health of the consumer or um, it impacts on the environment as well. There's a lot of work that needs to happen uh, uh, to, to make a standard rate and to do that, those studies to determine what the market failure is um, and then to uh, put forward um, an economic impact assessment and report because with regulations come enforcement. So you can't just put regulations out there, somebody needs to enforce it. Uh, and this enforcement comes with an element of, uh, of financial impact as well uh, for the consumer um, and, the, uh, and the manufacturers or the stakeholders that are meant to enforce the regulations or implement the regulations. So there's a lot of consultation that needs to take place around which standards that uh, need to be uh, compulsory. Certainly our engagement with uh, one of the regulators, National um, NRCS Regulator for Compulsory Specifications, work very close with the SABS and, and they um, reference a number of South African national standards as part of their regulatory regime. Um, so this uh, a balance between um, self-regulation in terms of uptake and utilization by the industry and um, on the other hand, extreme um, uh, implementation the compulsory implementation of, of standards. I would like to um, move on to the, the, the panel panelists aside and maybe a question or, or two uh, to the panelists. Uh, my first one goes to um, um, Robert. Uh, Robert, once again, thank you for a very insightful presentation. Uh, what I um, did see an element was on social technical resilience uh, and that is a, a, you know, a radical change in terms of thinking around standardization. Um, you know, as a national standards body and ahead of a national standards body, um, I think there's an element that we need to embrace and deliver on this type of, of, of sentiment. Um, because basically, um, from a standards perspective, we think of, um, of our publications as purely technical. And obviously, there's, there's an element of, of social aspects that come through it as well. Um, what would your brief advice to in terms of an approach um, from a national standards body uh, on, on developing these type of, of deliverables. Um, I'm putting out this out to you and I, and I trust uh, that um, you know, you'll be able to provide some degree of, of direction or comments um, towards this uh, particular initiative. Uh, Robert? Uh, thank you, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, we've been using the word socio-technical for a while. Um, and it's, it's a helpful word because it brings the human being in at multiple levels. Um, so at the one level, uh, let me start perhaps from the standards that I'm currently very involved in, which is around um, the, the set of NRS standards, which are very electricity supply standards. They're not national standards, but they um, some of them get taken up by the National uh, Energy Regulator, NERSA. Um, what we found is we obviously started off with load shedding as a very technical issue. It's about how you do load shedding without compromising the system such that it collapses. Um, so what we discovered is uh, in the process is there's a huge amount of um, work that has to be included in a standard like that that relates to number one, how decision making is undertaken, 
who gets communicated with what, uh, what kind of communication, um, how we publish the standards yet, uh, sorry, how we publish the load shedding schedules, for example, um, how we introduce those load shedding schedules in a way that's least disruptive. So, for example, one of the learnings in our second edition is that we don't shed the same people on consecutive days in winter, um, summer as well, but in winter it makes a big difference because if we load shed tonight and we load shed tomorrow night, <clears throat> which is typically what we'll do in winter is only shed at night, um, then you'll be impacted one of those and not both of those. So those sort of things taking in, 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 in bearing in mind the impact on, on society, on people, um, there's also another element which I might raise, which is we often think of these technical systems as if the human being in the system is a cog. Um, and sometimes the cog works and sometimes it's defective. And a lot of resilience and safety literature in, in the contemporary literature deals with this issue of human error um, from a social, social per human perspective, um, where we need to think differently about human beings. Human beings are variable, and that has positive and negative um, implications for the system. So we want to amplify the positive implications and we want to reduce the negative implications. So a positive implication is um, something needs to be done and somebody, and nobody's done it before, but someone's able to do it because they're there and they can make the right decision. So that sort of variability, uh, which a cog wouldn't be able to do. Um, but I think it's a very important language to introduce, which is that we don't see people as defective when something happens, but we need to understand the context in which decisions were taken. It's a huge body of work in that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's something to think about when we think about how standards are implemented and the management of those uh, right through the organization, from the board, as we heard, down to the supervisory level and the decisions taken at that level. So those are just off the, it's, it's a, fan, a, a, a fascinating topic. I'd love to spend a lot of time on it, um, but just top and tail, the, the two kind of very diverse parts of the social system. Thank you, Robert, to read those comments. And certainly, yeah, it's uh, we could actually have another webinar on this particular topic. And I think um, this is something that we need to embrace and start uh, putting this forward as part of our national technical committees and the type of thinking that we should be instituting as development of national standards. Um, I would like to move on to to Netson. Um, Netson, um, so and thank you for a very enlightening presentation. I would like to just understand or maybe from your perspective based on the surveys that you've conducted does south africa and the consumers have an appetite for the new normal or do you think that they are waiting for an old normal for the old normal to resume um thank you for that question um do south african consumers have an appetite for the new normal I think um, the the surveys that have been done prior to the lockdown actually showed that consumers really like to st uh, still go to the brick and mortar malls and really do uh, window shopping and physically um, accessing shops. However, lockdown has been, particularly level five, has been quite a different story altogether because it has it has forced them to it has forced consumers to. Um, to consider alternatives. However, you have to be mindful of which socioeconomic class groups are those. And it will be the usual, probably middle to upper income uh, 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 society groups that have been really embracing shopping apps and, and the rest. But as, as the images show you, that in the highly densely populated uh, unequal parts of the country, particularly in, 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 in poverty stricken areas, consumers are not ready for uh, for buying online or purchasing via apps. So we still have that discrepancy. And that's why I was even arguing that, unfortunately, the new normal creates an even bigger divide for us. Um, our efforts at poverty and uh, ending poverty and inequality will even be much more difficult as policymakers going forward because now um, others can access and others cannot. It's just the same thing with the schooling system. Others, other learners never stopped learning. Other learners are uh, had to stop learning. I don't know if I'm uh, making sense there. 
No, certainly. Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, it's very important to get a different viewpoint, uh, especially from the surveys that NCC is conducting in terms of what's happening in the marketplace and what responses we're getting um, uh, from the consumers as well. Uh, thank you for that reply. Um, moving on to Johan. Uh, Johan, um, and again, a great presentation on integration. Um, so there's been a lot of um, sentiment in the marketplace from a standards perspective around there are too many management system standards out in the marketplace. Um, like as an example, ISO 9000, 14000, uh, Occupational Health and Safety 45000, um, and we've got business continuity management systems, risk management systems. Um, and then it's, it becomes a so-called burden for industry to start implementing these standards. And secondly, um, providing self-compliance and, and more importantly, being certified towards uh, these standards as well. What is your take around this this um, understanding of too many management system standards in the marketplace? Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I think when you look at the process, how the standards are developed, is that there's a process really looking at the, uh, is there a demand for a specific standard? Uh, and then there is some discussion and so forth. Once it has been established that uh, there is demand for a standard, then you will go forward uh, in, in developing the, the standard. Now, now I'm, I'm, I do have specific views on that, but my views are not specifically on whether there is a, a, a valid reason for a 9,000 and a 14,000. I think those are, in my mind, clear cases because they are addressing a very specific area where there is a need and where there is a, a business value add. And when we look at uh, uh, um, recently, you know, cyber, there's a lot of talk about cyber, there's a lot of cases um, recently um, and increasingly so in terms of information security. Uh, where sensitive information of a company provided to a third party to do certain functions on your behalf, um, you know, was leaked. And it's not only from a company perspective, it's also from a, a privacy perspective uh, as well. Um, and, and nowadays, when you look at the, at the company, I think those days are gone that you can really draw a circle around the company. So these are my borders. Uh, you're so integrated into the suppliers and, 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 and clients that you're dealing with uh, that uh, it becomes difficult. So you have to have a mechanism of trust. And again, looking at the overall governance uh, where the board is overall responsibility for whatever the company does. Uh, you, know, you need an element of, of, of trust uh, from making sure that you will receive things in time from a supplier when you make a certain of your information available to a third party, that they will deal with it adequately, you need to have that type of that, that level of trust. So I am a big proponent of, of if you would like to have trust in the environment, you cannot operate without trust, but you have to consider um, the element of certification. Uh, and of course, it is not a blanco type of environment. It is where it does make sense, where it's really criti critical to your business in, in environment, and where you really need to, 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 to uphold trust. So there's a lot of comments that, you know, you get certification and the certification applies for the day the certificate is, is issued and, and so forth. But that is not uh, actually true. And so when you look at the certificate in a management system, the nature of the management system is looking at what your situation is, the implementation thereof, inclusive of the monitoring processes and the continuous improvement processes as well. So it is not a matter of time, a point in time type of environment. You have more trust, you know, given the certification process that there is effective liveliness in the management system of a third party. So from that perspective, I, 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 I'm a big proponent, you know, to, to consider that where it makes sense uh, to you. However, Coming back to your original question is there is an element of, you know, when you look at the a theme uh, of, 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 of practice, that there might be uh, quite a few internal standards. Uh, if you take uh, ISO 22,301, uh, 22, uh, 27,000 series and so forth, there's quite a few of them. And we have to be careful that we, we don't dish out too many standards there that actually has to be 
combined and integrated again within the context of the organization before it will be approved and, and, and driven. So it's, it is also for courses, uh, you have to be careful and consider it what, whatever you would like to do, but the, the, the big themes of, 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 of standards, uh, ISO 31000, the 22301, um, uh, 9000, 14000, so we, we can go on. I think there's a very specific demand for that. Um, and I'm a big proponent and supporter of certification where needed. Thank you, Johan. I really appreciate the comments uh, around um, your thoughts around the various um, standards available. As you say, it's uh, horses for courses. Um, certification is just not a tick box exercise and, and having a paper on the wall, it has to create value. And that third party impartiality has to provide uh, evidence that an organization is achieving its organizational objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, participants, um, we are out of time. Um, I don't see on my side further comments or questions. Um, on behalf of the SABS, I would like to uh, conclude um, this session, this webinar, uh, um, by thanking the, um, the presenters, um, Robert, Johan and um, Netson. You were fantastic presenters and uh, you shared um, some very important knowledge uh, and experiences. And I know there's a lot of um, work that a lot of organizations, participants uh, who have been part of this um, webinar will take back home and start imparting these good practices that have been put forward and imparting the knowledge around business continuity management systems. So once again, thank you for the team and the participants. I'd also um, like to uh, just mention that um, as part of the SABS's response to COVID-19, uh, we have put forward a number of standards that are accessible on our website. Uh, they are freely accessible. Um, part of these standards include SANS 22301, which is the business continuity management system, amongst other standards related to personal protective equipment as well. So um, colleagues are more than welcome to go into our website. I think there's a small registration form that needs to be completed uh, and you'll have access to the standards for a period of time. This is in response together with um, with ISO and IEC, who are we are members of in terms of uh, our support uh, in combating uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So once again, um, I would like to close the session and um, well, before I uh, be, before I close the session, I'd uh, just like to open the floor for any of our panelists uh, to say a last word or two. Um, I will now open up uh, the um, the session for a last word or two. Robert, uh, starting with Robert, uh, then Johan and Netson. Uh, maybe just from my side, I think this is a great initiative um, from the standards perspective. Um, as you realize, I'm obviously uh, uh, very invested in, in the importance of standards and uh, how we could make them work uh, for for our country. Um, and I think this format works really nicely um, going forward. It's 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 quick. It's easy to uh, well, I don't know. There's a lot of work behind, but it's easy to come in and, and participate. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Sure. Thank you, Robert. Johan. Uh, my appreciation again as well for the opportunity to, to share some ideas here. I think uh, as well it's a, it's a great initiative and an opportunity to, to share some some best practices and so forth. Uh, South Africa would like to be uh, increasing our competitiveness um, uh, in South Africa, but also in the context of, of Africa, you know, the, the broader goals and so forth. And if we enter into regional cooperation, global cooperation and so forth as well, Standards and so forth are very important, uh, you know, to, to achieve that consistency and so forth. And if you can combine consistency with effectiveness and um, um, uh, efficiency and so forth, we are on the right way. So thanks a lot for this opportunity. You're welcome, Johan. Thank you. Um, Netson? Um, just wanted to say uh, thank you also to the SABS for uh, having uh, me on the panel. 
I think um, from uh, an NCC perspective is to say that um, I think adopting even the language that the Sustainable Development Goals always use is to say, let's not leave any consumers behind. So as we formulate standards and as we formulate responses to COVID-19, let's find ways in which we cater for the consumer who um, is already marginalized or who is categorized by the Consumer Protection Act as a vulnerable consumer. And let's also take care of the consumer who is a wealthy consumer who can afford um, the changes that are happening. But let's have a change that uh, or a, a continuity process that leaves no consumers behind. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and and uh, once again, thank you to the panelists for their uh, last views and comments. Ladies and gentlemen um, and fellow participants, I would like to officially close this webinar. Wish you well, stay safe uh, and be well. Take care and uh, bye for now.